in eternity. Our God, most holy, most awesome, has given us a word you can read. He's given us the Holy Spirit to be our teacher. And he's promised to make us holy because he said, You shall be holy as I, the Lord God, am holy. Before we begin our study in Mark today, it's exciting to have the th among us. The Thulans have been out. A precious little baby boy that Bethany had recently. It's good to, uh, to see the Heinz with us as well. All the babies are doing fine. We get thumbs up on the babies. Good. We've got more coming. That's exciting. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel, chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. For thinking about this overarching theme, the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel in action. And you've seen these action words by now. Immediately, then, next, he's just piling up, emphasizing that Jesus was engaged and hastening to the cross where he would fulfill the ultimate purpose for which he came to earth. Today we look at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6 on this... Uh, this idea of doubtful speculations and the miracles of Jesus. There's a couple of things set together here today that, that we haven't seen much of in Mark. I want to ask you if you would though uh, to stand with me while I read Mark 6, 1 to 6. Just follow along in your Bibles. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. If you don't have a Bible with you, we'll provide the text on the screens for you. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here? with us and they took offense at him Jesus said to them out honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household and he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them and he marveled because of their unbelief and he went about among the villages teaching this is what? It is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Help us to learn today more of that tension that must exist between the, the sovereign power of God and the responsibility of we, His creatures. Thank you. Be seated if you would. One commentator has called chapter 5, the chapter we've just finished studying through, the, the faith chapter. And he says this, if, that, if that's the faith chapter, then chapter 6 could be titled the no faith chapter. We're going to see, we just read something that's staggering about the miracle working power of Jesus in his hometown. He comes home, and I want us to see this, this text before us today in, in under three considerations. One is that he returns home to Nazareth, and I put home in quotes for a reason there. Second, the impact of Jesus' synagogue teaching. And third, Jesus' response to their doubting speculations. First, he returns home to Nazareth, the text tells us in verse 1. Nazareth is where he was... He, grew up, where he was raised, where he was taught by his, uh, uh, his father, Joseph. Joseph played that role of a, of a guardian father to him. He was taught by Joseph uh, the skill of carpentry. It's not his ultimate home. You know that as well as I do. It's his home. He's in his home now. He died and rose again ascended into heaven. But but in this ministry, in his public ministry, he returns 
to the place where he grew up, where people knew him, knew his family. And his text just simply tells us he went away from there and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him to his fatherland. That's going to be significant because as best we can tell through the studies, that's the first time he has returned home since he made himself public at the baptism of John. Second, I want you to see, though, the, the impact of Jesus' synagogue teachings. As on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They had these questions. In order to teach in the synagogue, you had to be asked. You had to be invited. You had to be handed the scroll by the, by the one who guarded the scroll. We've seen this before in the study of Mark, and once again now in his hometown, the people we pick up here, they've heard what he did in Capernaum. They've heard of his mighty works, which is the ESV's uh, translation of, of the word miracle. So he, there he is. His habit was to meet at any synagogue where he happened to be in that town on the Sabbath. The hand and scroll. He reads, if you look at Matthew's uh, telling of this and Luke's telling of this, he reads from that passage in Isaiah 61. And it makes an application, if you remember, in the other accounts. Mark just tells us about the episode. He doesn't tell us the content of it. When you put those parallel uh, experiences side by side, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see that he declares himself from the, from the Isaiah passage to be uh, the one who's to come, the, the anointed one, the Messiah. He then chides the crowd, not in Mark's gospel account, but in another one, of how God performed mighty miracles among Gentiles in context in places where there were plenty of Jews who could have received the miracle. And this, of course, sets them at odd against him. It sets, sets their teeth off. They grind. But right now in this passage, we're told that as he was teaching in the synagogue, many who heard him were astonished. They were just they were taken back. It's the, it's the same thing we heard earlier in Mark. We've ne never heard a man teach like this man teach. And they asked these things. Where did this man get these things? Where, where, did, he, where did he learn this? Behind that is the question, he's not from either one of the rabbinic schools. He was not formally trained by the, by the Jewish equivalent of a seminary. Where do you get these things? What, what is the wisdom given to him? Where did this come from? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Now those questions, right there you would say, well, those questions that may not have an immediate answer to them should, should instill awe and wonder in them. That this man is not like any other man. This, this, this synagogue experience is not like any other synagogue experience they had had. They'd not had someone come to their synagogue as a guest who had the reputation Jesus had of being able to work mighty works, powers, and wonders. Who seemed to be able to, to read from the prophets read from the scrolls with such authority and then claim that Isaiah was talking about him and you would think that that would then constrain people to simply bow down and worship but it doesn't go that direction Their questions continue to come up. Is not this the carpenter? The son of Mary? Brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? Isn't this the fellow that grew up here? The carpenter? We thought when he left he'd gone off to start his own carpenter business. 
Now one of the gospel accounts adds, is not this the carpenter's son? But here, what Mark understood them saying was really something that was very, uh, very insulting. You would not, in Jesus' time, call a man, a young man, the son of his mother. Unless you were casting aspersion over circumstances surrounding his birth. They might as well have said, isn't this the illegitimate child of Mary? When you see that, you see the tone is changing. Because they were not so much overtaken by the wisdom he manifested of contemplating the source from which he got such things or the source from which he got the power that he had to, to perform these miracles, these mighty works. Those were questions that they were having because they did not respect him. So the text says, he took offense at them, at him. He took offense. They just were offended. They were offended that a mere carpenter's son, whose circumstances surrounding his birth were problematic, that the steward in the synagogue would hand a scroll to him, that he would have the audacity to parade around Capernaum and Nazareth and Galilee claiming to be a rabbi. His teaching in this instance did not so much evoke adoration, did not so much evoke a humble reception of the truth he was declaring, did not so much evoke an awe to be in the presence of one who clearly spoke with authority like no one they'd ever heard speaks with authority. His presence there rather agitated them. They took offense at him. They took offense that he'd have the audacity to say, as recorded in the other Gospels, this passage that I've just read to you is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm, I'm he who heals the sick and binds up the brokenhearted and sets the captive free. It's a sad situation. But we're seeing it increasingly in our culture. It's fascinating to me as I, as I watch just what's happening. How any, the slightest little expression that you might have a, an affinity for, some level of admiration for Jesus, is offensive to this culture. To be a Christian in this culture is to be identified as someone who's, who's anti this, anti that, anti, 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 anti and, and it piles up on you. And so we read this and we need to remember Jesus said, if they hate you, remember they hated me first. And so we see this third place, his response to their doubting speculations. And he does this by making a declaration a determination and then a disposition. Let's look at it. He declares to them in verse 4. A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Now first we need to see that he's declared himself to be a prophet. He's not insinuating that he has received honor everywhere else he's gone or that he will receive honor wherever else he goes. He's not asserting that, but he is likening himself unto a prophet. Moses spoke of that prophet. 
or the prophet who was coming. But he recognizes in them and chides them that it's easy to despise someone you know. The old adage, familiarity breeds contempt. I've seen it in church situations before where someone, God may raise someone up for leadership and someone will, will have, be offended because they remember him as in times past, such and such. Now you and I read this and we go, how could anybody treat Jesus that way? And what he said is often true, but it wouldn't be true for me, you would like to think. That I would honor him. I would pay homage to him. I would bow and worship him. I would adore him. I would yield to him. I would love him. I would proclaim him. And we need to learn from this as we apply it to our lives today. That we need to learn to honor the work of God in a person right now and not weave together that person's past and make that the statement. I, don't, I know people that hold divorce against other people. The scripture teaches how we handle that and we've handled it biblically here. But it's not the unpardonable sin. There's repentance, there's recovery, there's restoration, there's redemption. But the odd thing about Jesus is they, they can't look back on his past and, and be offended by his sinful conduct. He never sinned. Now, I could go back to Beaumont, Texas, and there'd be plenty of people who could say, whoa, no, 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 no. <laughs> Not, uh, it popped up on Facebook the other day. I remember when Karen and Billy Askell, I thought, well, that's a, long, that's a blast from the past there. They couldn't, they might have trouble accepting me based on watching me grow up. Jesus didn't even have that. He was perfect. He was the perfect child, which no doubt stirred up his biological brothers and sisters. And you can almost hear them saying, you think you're perfect, don't you? Someone says that to us, we go, no, I'm not perfect. You say it to him, he's, well, yes. So he's defamed when he goes back to his hometown. But his, it's this determination that he makes in the light of this that, that just grips me. Verse 5, he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. We talked in, in the recent past about the compassion of Jesus for those who were hurting. So even in this situation where there were people despising him, offended by him. Some either bring their sick or some who are sick draw near to him and he cannot help but show compassion. It's in his nature. But this statement, he could do no mighty work there. He could do no miracles, powerful miracles there. Matthew 13, 58, the parallel to this says, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Could do, no. Did not do. You see, when, when people who are taught the truth, as just what happened in the synagogue, people who are taught the truth, reject the truth, they have no reason to expect miracles to attend that, to convince them of the truth. It happened to him on the cross. The Jewish leaders taunting him. You saved others. You can't save yourself. Come down from the cross and we'll believe. No. In the face of doubtful speculation, 
He will do no miracle. Because they did not believe. And yet even in the midst of that, he had to show compassion. He couldn't help it. And then here's the amazing thing to me. Even more so than that. This disposition he shows. He marveled because of their unbelief. There's another time in the Gospels where we're told that Jesus marveled. He marveled at the faith of the centurion who said, I have a sick child, sick unto death, but you don't need to come, Rabbi. I'm a man who commands people under my authority. And if I say go, they go. All you need to do is speak the word. And I know my, my child will be healed. A Gentile. A centurion. A Roman. And Jesus, we're told, marveled at such faith in his capacity to do miracles. I was thinking about this text in preparation to preach it this week. I wonder sometimes if we don't get caught in the snare of believing. The old, yes, we, be, we believe he can do all things, but then doubting that he will. Like Lazarus' sister, Lord, I know that we'll all come in the resurrection. But if you'd have been here before my brother died, you could have healed him. I know you can do these great things, but... And I wonder if, if that's not what happens sometimes to Christian individuals, to Christian homes, Christian churches. That we don't go all out, we don't sell all out to say our God is able, absolutely, unequivocally, irrevocably, infallibly able. It's the attitude of the three children in Babylon who were thrown into the fiery furnace. Before they go, they say, know this king, our God is able to deliver us from this fire. And what you see is you see God delivering them in the fire. And this passage becomes for us a challenge as to how we express faith. Ask in faith, not doubting. As opposed to, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We all struggle with it. I'm, I'm not chiding anybody here. I'm just pointing out to you that when the scripture says that Jesus would do no miracle, could do no miracle there because they did not have faith that he was who he said he was. This is not even necessarily saving faith on these people's part. It's, it's what the, the writers, commentators speak of as, as faith in the miracles. It's historical faith, believing that Jesus was a historical person. There's miraculous faith, faith that he can do miracles. There's saving faith wrought by the Spirit. Which, by the way, when the Spirit works saving faith in us, then, then the issue of historical faith ought to be settled. The issue of miraculous faith ought to be settled. We ought to be a people who can say without hesitation, our God can heal this person. We step over the line somewhat when we say our God will heal. Unless we're willing to grant that a part of God's healing power is sometimes simply taking people on to glory. Not letting them linger and suffer on earth, but taking them to their home in heaven. But it's a call to the church to be sure that we as individuals, we as a body of Christ, don't talk faith out of one side of our mouths, doubt out of the other side of our mouths. Remember what he said? In the previous passage, to Jairus's, to Jairus about his daughter, stop doubting. Believe. Believe. 
So what are you, what's, what's in your life this morning? Some of you, you ache for. Maybe it's about relationships. Maybe there's a heartache about a relationship ought to be. What aches in your heart today? Maybe it's a, maybe you struggle with physical pain, constant physical pain. Maybe you're upside down is the fancy term in our economy today, financially. Maybe you're struggling with depression, despair, discouragement. What should our attitude be toward that, individually? Believe. I do not know what God has prepared for me in terms of the way he will have me walk, but I do know this. God is more than able to meet and remove every concern I have if that's his pleasure. You see, it's not doubting to say, your will be done. That's not doubt. It is doubting to say, yes, I know so-and-so has this need, this physical need, he's fighting this battle, and I know, I know God can heal him, but that's opening the gate to the path of doubt. Jesus would not do mighty works in his hometown because the people there were speculating about him. Having acknowledged that he had done mighty works, they still were doubtful. And doubt turned into despising. Nothing to challenge you as the church this morning. We gather to pray every Wednesday night and we have a prayer sheet we go over and we share burdens with one another and pray with one another in various settings as well. But to pray believing. Lord, we're going, we're going to believe that so-and-so who's battling this situation, that you are going to give them victory in it. We're going to pray believing that that's going to happen. Not at all trying to put you in a box or a corner because we don't do that. You're the sovereign God. But this text, if it teaches us anything, is God is sovereign in his power and man is responsible for how he re responds to that power. And in Nazareth, they responded with doubt and Jesus did not do mighty miracles among them. Do you want to see the Lord do mighty miracles among us. Now he's done some. Brother Norman just rattled off several here. You want to see more like that? Greater still? Stop doubting. Don't let doubt mingle with faith. If necessary, cry out, Dear Holy Spirit of God, my teacher, teach me to believe that my God is able, yes, more than able. I want to see in my life, in the lives of those I love, and in the life of the church, for the glory of God and the advance of the gospel, I want to see the mighty signs of Jesus manifested. Not to make me giddy, not to make me brash, Oh, that he might magnify who he is. And by the way, in the meantime, with your help, I will magnify Jesus in my words and my deeds, trusting that miracle power will be manifested in my circumstances or in the circumstances of my loved one. You see, if we believe that way, then church houses will start being filled. If we believe that way, then prayer meetings will take on a greater interest and greater energy on the part of the people of God. Because we cannot wait to see what he's going to do next. What we've seen God do in Curtis and Jill Griffin's life is a miracle. And I won't go into the details of why and how, 
But if you've been close to that situation at all, you know that legally and culturally, they never would have been allowed to have this child as their own. Believe. Believe. That doesn't mean become a PhD in, in the knowledge of things. It means to become like a child. To believe. Do you want to see God perform mighty works in your life, in your family, in your situation, in your circumstances, in your church? Then learn from this passage. Don't be caught mixing doubt. The theology of God's power, yes, but. No, yes. Amen. So be it. That means for some here who are not saved, that you need to believe He will save you. You need to believe that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. Some of you here have heard the gospel story scores of times, hundreds of times, yet you've not believed, you've not put faith in Christ because there's this doubt that plagues you. That's what it means for some. For others, for those who are followers of Christ, it means to believe in the future God has for you. And what he has in store for us. Not mix it with doubt. Yes, I know he can, but. No, that little. Let's let God use that conjunction, okay? Because he seems to use it very redemptively in the scriptures. We don't use it so well in our lives. Stop doubting. Believe. And he showed us in this passage why. Doubting will not evoke a miracle from God. Faith, according to God's will, is a great climate for mighty works. In Jesus' name, let's pray.